My name is Christine Muir. I'm a community librarian at Cary Library. Part of my job here is to plan and host events like tonight's, which I'm very excited about. I'd like to ask you to take a minute to silence your cell phones so we don't interrupt the presentation. If anyone needs an assistive listening device, I have some here on the table. They may help amplify the sound for you. Um, so come on up and get one or raise your hand and I'll bring one to you. At all of our programs, we'd like to thank the donors to the Cary Memorial Foundation. Um, they support all of our programming efforts here, providing technology or whatever other supplies and tools we need. We will have time for questions from the audience tonight. Because of the, the way the room is set up, we do ask that you wait for somebody to come to you with a microphone so that everybody can hear the question, and then the speaker will answer it. Tonight's program on jumpstarting the American economy is part of the Cary series on science and economics. It's my distinct honor and pleasure to work with Mr. George Burnell in bringing you these programs, which always offer fascinating speakers on a variety of topics. Normally, Mr. Burnell introduces our speakers, but he can't be here tonight, so it falls to me. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Jonathan Gruber, the board professor of economics at MIT, where he has taught since 1992. He is also the director of the healthcare program at the National Bureau of Economic Research and the former president of the American Society of Health Economics, or Economists, sorry. He has published more than 175 research articles, edited six research volumes, and written three books, including the one that serves as the basis for tonight's talk. Copies of that book are available for purchase from Dick Haley booksellers at the table at the back of the audience. They are $20 for a hardcover copy. Mr. Gruber will sign books after the talk, and the line for that will form along this wall. He'll stand here to do that. In 2006, Dr. Gruber received the American Society of Health Economists inaugural medal for the best health economist in the nation, aged 40 and under. From 2003 to 6, he was a key architect of Massachusetts' ambitious health reform effort. During 2009 and 10, he served as a technical consultant to the Obama administration and worked with both the administration and Congress to help craft the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. In 2011, he was named one of the top 25 most innovative and practical thinkers of our time by Slate Magazine. In both 2006 and 2012, he was rated one of the top 100 most powerful people in healthcare in the United States by Modern Healthcare Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Gruber. Hello, oh good, thank you. Thank you, Christine, for the introduction. It's really weird to be at the library and talking loudly, actually in a microphone, right? <laughs> this is very strange for me. So uh, if I start to whisper, you'll understand why. Um, after having spent so many years whispering to my children in the corner, it's nice to be able to hear to speak in regular voice. So thanks so much for having me here tonight and to folks for coming out uh, to hear the talk. I'm gonna talk for a little while and then I'd love to hear your questions. I'm talking tonight about my new book with uh, Simon Johnson at MIT, my co-author on this book. And the sort of taking off point for this book, we think, is an event which many of us remember quite in detail, which was the search for the new headquarters for Amazon HQ2. You remember that was in the news a lot last year. Uh, Amazon announced in early 2018 they would be uh, looking for new headquarters. Um, when they announced that, they said towns in America, cities in America had six weeks for a detailed proposal for why they should be Amazon HQ2's location. 230 cities in America responded with detailed proposal, only six weeks. And Simon and I were thinking, that's kind of interesting, because here we are in an economy that's been pretty steadily growing for a long time out of the recession. The unemployment rate appears to be at historic lows. And yet these cities seem desperate to get the jobs that Amazon wanted to bring. Why are these cities trying so hard to get this Amazon HQ2? And so we started looking behind the numbers and realized the numbers aren't quite as rosy as they look in two senses. The first sense is that the American economy is not growing at nearly the pace it used to. In the decades after World War II, the economy grew at the order of 4% a year. That means with the same amount of work and savings and everything, we get 4% more stuff every year. Now it grows at less than 2% a year. Uh, it's projected to do so for the, for, the near, for the near and long future. Um, so that's the first sense. 
The second sense, however, is that even that growth is really not very well shared in America. And while we talk a lot about income inequality, we don't talk enough about geographic inequality. It's not really shared around the country, and particularly a thriving east and west coast, of which we're at the hub, one of those hubs right now. Uh, but we have the rest of the country that's not succeeding, that's not getting the innovative cutting edge jobs that pay a lot of money and yield the, the innovations of tomorrow. And that basically is, is leading to a lot of the divisions we see in our country uh, all the way to Washington TV today. Um, a lot of divisions we're seeing in politics, divisions in economics are geographically driven and driven by really sort of this growing apart, uh, if you will, between the coast and the rest of the country. And so we started thinking about, well, what's going on? What changed? What's really happened? We realized that there's been an enormously underappreciated and fundamental change in the US over the last 40 years, which has been an abandonment of the role of the government as a leader in developing new science and technology. By the mid-1960s, the US government spent, as much, spent so much money on research and development that amounted to 2% of our entire GDP. 2% of the entire US economy was government funding of research and development. Today, today that's fallen to about 0.66% of GDP, fallen by about <coughs> two thirds. And as I'll discuss, the private sector is not filling that gap. The private sector is not filling that gap to lead the innovative scientific discoveries that create jobs and new industries in our country. So what we argue in the book is the government needs to take that leadership role again, but it needs to do in a very different way than it did in the 50s and 60s, where it gave the money to the elite universities on the coast, by and large, mm -hmm. and led to a lot of the postal boom we have today. The government needs to spread that money around the country. In particular, we think there are many places in America that are poised to become next generation technology hubs if the government gives them the jump start they need. So what I'm going to do in this talk is try to essentially go through in about a half hour the gist of the book. Um, the book is probably divided really into three parts. There's the fun part, that's the history. There's the nerdy part, that's the economics. And then there's the sort of uh, visionary part, or uh, you know, if, if, you, if you want delusional part, and that's the proposal. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of those three parts, and then I'd love to get your thoughts and questions uh, uh, after I'm done. So let me start with the history. And the history begins with um, the Oval Office in the spring of 1940. In the spring, you know, I'm not, I was not a huge World War II history buff until I started working this book. I hadn't realized how dire things looked for the Allied powers in the spring of 1940. I knew Hitler just blitzed across Europe. I hadn't realized what a surprise that was and how much that was technology driven. That in driving across Europe and driving Britain off at Dunkirk, Hitler revealed a whole set of technologies we didn't really realize he had. Meanwhile, the US in all of 1939 had produced six tanks could not in make torpedoes that actually exploded on impact and had, and had soldiers practicing with broomsticks instead of guns, okay? So in this moment of desperation, a man named Vannevar Bush, a former dean at MIT and, car and at that time headed the Carnegie Institution for Science, you pulled a lot of strings to get an audience with FDR and said rather boldly, the way to win World War II is for you to give me as much money as you can, for me to hire as many scientists as I can to invent new technologies to win the war. And FDR said yes, very quickly. And what, what was born was a scientific organization that did exactly that, that invented the technologies that were central to winning World War II, and did so in an unprecedented fashion. Before World War II, the US government spent 0.04% of our economy on R&D. In the World War II push, that rose to half a percent of the economy. And it rose through massive hiring of basically any scientists available at one point <coughs> Two-thirds of all physicists in America worked on this wartime effort, developing new technologies. And it worked. We developed technologies that were instrumental in winning World War II, notably radar. Um, one of the radar inventors actually lived in my house, uh, the old Mimno house. Some of you may know it, uh, on Pleasant Street in Lexington. Uh, um, and uh, radar and other technologies were invented based on that government R&D. And they turned the tide. For example, in the Battle of the Atlantic, where before radar was perfected in the US, uh, the Germans were sinking 44 of our ships a month. After radar was added, uh, it fell to one a month. And that was really an element that turned the tide in World War II. But it didn't just do that. It actually also led to an enormous economic boom because it turned out all this cool stuff we invented to win the war was actually the basis of many consumer goods. How many of you remember the name of the first microwave oven? It was the radar range. Came out of the invention of radar. And many, many other consumer goods from the modern aircraft, 
to uh, the perfection of penicillin, the birth of the modern pharmaceutical industry, all came out of this effort. After World War II, there was a bit of a lull, but then we faced a new challenge, which was Sputnik. And shortly after that, John F. Kennedy announced that we had the challenge of getting a man to the moon. And to meet those challenges, the US government doubled down its investment in public R&D. It's raised the spending, as I said, on public R&D to 2% of our entire economy. One in every $50 in America went to government sponsorship of science in this country. And the rewards were astounding. Literally, every component of the modern US technological economy is born out of the research the government sponsored. Everything from pharmaceuticals to digital, co digital computing, the GPS you used to find your way here tonight, everything came out of that effort. So let's take as the example one of the most important sectors in America, digital computing. Okay? In the 1930s, the International Business Machines Company, IBM, was a modest sized company, had about 20,000 employees, so pretty big but not an enormous company, you know, doing sort of you know, reasonably cutting edge work until the US government decided it needed to hire a contractor in the wake of World War II, in the wake of the Cold War, to actually develop a next generation missile system. So they hired IBM. And the US government said, so we're going to hire you. A, we are going to be the person, your main purchaser of all your new technologies. And B, we're going to pay your R&D. And the US government actually paid not just for IBM, but for the entire digital computing sector in the 1960s, paid half of that sector's R&D costs, OK? Including things like saying, we realize the longest program ever written at that point was 50,000 lines. We want a 1 million line program. And we're going to hire a small company called the Rand Corporation to write it. They then grew up to be a major. Uh, a major force in advancing technology and knowledge. In area after area, the US government's investment in R&D led, led to these new sectors that then led to a booming American economy when matched with something else. Because while the government was doing this, creating demand for new technologies, it also realized we had a new supply of scientists. So we passed the National Defense Education Act in 1958, which led to enormous investment in educating scientists <coughs> all the way from the Elementary school level, all the way to the university level. By the mid-1980s, 90% of all graduate students in computer science were paid for by the US government. Okay? We basically invested in the demand for skills by, increasing new, by creating new technologies that led to growth, and the supply of skills by investing in education so people could have those jobs. And the result was, and you, know, you can take my economics class at MIT if you want to learn more about this, but basically when demand goes up and supply goes up, the price goes up. And the price in this case was wages. Okay? We increased wages dramatically and we led to the creation of the greatest middle class the world's ever seen. Okay? We basically, these new jobs were quality jobs being taken by newly educated engineers and scientists and it led to an enormous increase in standard of living in America. The US, basically US income per capita essentially doubled in real terms from 1947 to 1973. Literally, we could get twice as much stuff within 26 years uh, as, um, as a result of all, these, uh, of all these innovations. And those gains were shared equally. Literally, every income group in society saw growth. It was truly a rising tide that lifted all boats. So what happened? Well, what happened was really three things. First of all was a bit the hubris of scientists. Scientists had it pretty good. In fact, in 1960, the Time Magazine Man of the Year was the scientist. Okay, a uh, science doing pretty well, and so they started worrying about things like inventing a nuclear pen, and not things like the dangers of nuclear radiation. And Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962, which was poo-pooed by a lot of scientists, was a real shot across the bow about the dangers of some of this technological advancement we were doing that we weren't paying enough attention to. The second thing was that scientists and politicians stopped seeing eye to eye. When you had a common enemy, be it Hitler, or the Russians, or the moon, uh, it was easy to get together and be on the same page and move forward together. But when politicians wanted to do things like, for example, invest massive amounts of money in supersonic aircraft, and scientists said, actually, that's not a really good thing to invest money in because the sonic booms are so loud that, they'll, uh, that the harm to society is, is more than the, the benefit of faster flight. And uh, then suddenly politicians get mad that scientists aren't supporting what they want. And in particular, Richard Nixon wanted to set up a new anti-ballistic missile system, and scientists uh, were negative about it in test public testimony, Nixon responded by firing his science advisor and shutting down the White House Office of Science. As we say in the book, if you speak truth to power, power will cut your funding. And that's what happened uh, in large part. Finally, there was a lot more competition from public dollars. The Great Society introduced a whole series of new, what we call mandatory spending programs, like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, 
which are putting new, well, South Shore is around, but it's greatly expanded, which are putting new pressure on the public budget. Meanwhile, the Vietnam War had cost hundreds of billions of dollars. So there was more competition for those dollars. And then, in probably one of the most important events for public finance, the anti-tax revolution, which began in California and culminated with the election of Ronald Reagan, led to enormous pressure, downward pressure on tax rates and downward pressure on revenue raising. As a result, what you had was there was pressure to lower the government budget. You had these growing mandatory programs like Social Security and Medicare, which get funded no matter what. That means something's got to give. And what gave a lot was public R&D funding. It fell continuously. Public R&D funding rose under Democrats and Republicans, and it fell under Democrats and Republicans. Most recently, fell enormously. Well, most recently fell a lot uh, under President Obama uh, coming, out of the, coming out of the Great Recession in the, de in the uh, debt ceiling deals we all know about. One of the things that got cut a lot was R&D, and it's continued to be cut under President Trump. So we now have fallen from a peak of 2% of GDP to 0.66% of GDP public spending. To fix ideas, at 2% of GDP, we were something like four or five times the next highest country in the world. Today, we're 10th, okay? So we fall enormously both in levels as a share of our economy and relative to the rest of the world. Now, the question you should ask yourself now, or if you were classically trained in economics, you would be asking yourself is, and I should care why? I mean, after all, the private sector does R&D. Indeed, if you look at total R&D in America, Total R&D spending is actually flat over the last several decades at about 2.5% of GDP. So why should I be worried about this? And so the second part of the book is arguing that standard economics, not crazy socialism, but actually standard economics, says that the private sector will underinvest in R&D and, and the US economy will not achieve its potential without government intervention. And why is that? Well, that's because the private sector, so there's two fundamental flaws in the private sector model for R&D. The first flaw is the problem of spillovers. That fundamental scientific investment doesn't just benefit a company, it benefits other companies, including potentially the company's competitors. And that's not so great from the company's perspective. Okay, so as a result, it's well known that companies underinvest in R&D. Now you can do this in a number of ways, I can illustrate this in a number of ways. One way I can point you to the economic literature, which suggests that the benefit of R&D to society is two and a half times greater than the benefit to any one company leading them to underinvest, or I can do it through stories as we do some in the book. Like the story of what happened when a US company, Merck, and a Japanese company, Sankyo, competed to develop statins. We know about statins, some of us in the room may be on statins, they're a life-saving drug that lowers cholesterol. They're being developed in the early 1980s by these two competing companies. And then Merck heard through the, through the grapevine that Sankyo had stopped its development of a statin because some dogs had died in the animal's phase of the trials. So Merck went to Seiko and said, oh my God, what happened? They said, we're not gonna tell you. You're a competitor. They said, look, we'll pay you, we'll partner with you, we'll do whatever. And Seiko said, no, we're not gonna tell you. We'll just, you know, you heard the dog's died, that's all you're gonna know. And so Merck shut down its trials because it didn't want to take a chance, okay? Five years later, some academics got permission for the FDA to do a special trial of statins. Turned out that the, the, what happened to the dogs had nothing to do with the statins. They were fine. Today, statins save hundreds of thousands of lives every year and have saved trillions of dollars in US medical care costs. But you know what? That means if they save 200,000 lives a year, that means there's a million people who died because we waited five years to develop this because the companies would not share the spillovers or the benefits of the research with each other, okay? Research has general benefits and fundamentally companies will invest in what's good for their bottom line, not what creates the best base of knowledge. Another way to see this is look at corporate science. Some of you may have been corporate scientists at some point. Corporate science was a, where a lot of the cutting edge science happened in America. A number of Nobel Prizes were worn by, won by scientists not in academia, but working in corporations, okay? That has gone away. Publications by corporate scientists have fallen by 60% in the last 25 years. Corporate scientists no longer publish, they no longer share their knowledge with general, in general. They're just focused on what's, on what's making their own company's bottom line better. Which leads to innovation, to be sure, but does not lead to the kind of breakthrough innovation that leads to creation of new sectors and fundamentally increases in new jobs in America. Okay, so that's one problem. The second problem is a problem of finance, which is, look, the people who have cool ideas are often sort of, you know, nerds like me, who have sort of cool ideas, but they don't know how to start a company, they don't know how to take that and sort of create a company out of it, turn it into products. So they turn to do that, in particular, they don't have the money to do it, so they turn to the venture capital sector. 
And I've all heard of the venture capital sector. It's sort of a star feature of the US economy. It's the envy of the rest of the world. 60% of the US stock market today is companies, 60% of the value of the US stock market is companies that were founded with VC dollars. Okay, it's an incredible, it's an incredible sex story. But except where it's not. And where it's not is the fact that the VC model is not a model that fundamentally supports long run scientific breakthrough. Because the way venture capitalists work is they have a fund with some investors and they tell those investors, well, we're gonna invest a bunch of companies. It's called Spray and Pray. We're gonna put a little bit of money, no, not a little to me, but a little of them, two, three, five, ten million dollars in a bunch of companies. Within a few years, once we figure out which one's succeeding, we'll put a lot more money to that company. So within 10 years, you've made a lot of money. Well, that's a model that works great for new apps. It's not a model that works great for new fundamental breakthroughs like new clean energy technologies. As a result, the VC sector is biased towards financing quick turn, risky, but low capital, quick turnaround investments. Not the, fun, not the different kind of risky investments which lead to fundamental new scientific breakthroughs. And to see this, once again, I can point to the academic evidence or we can talk about the example of Boston Power. Boston Power was a battery company uh, created by some, uh, some professors from Tufts. Uh, I think it was from Tufts, I forget. Um, so this, this, power, this battery company, um, they were creating new cutting edge lithium ion batteries, which is a really important part of our modern uh, economy as we, as we try to move, move, uh, move away from fossil fuels. Um, they were doing quite well. They had customers including Hewlett Packard and Saab. And they wanted to expand it. Particularly, they wanted to build a $200 million new plant in Auburn, Massachusetts, a place creating f something like 500 jobs and a place that needed them. And the venture capitalists wouldn't do it. They said, look, that's too much money. That's a really risky long-term bet. We're not going to get that money back for a long time. We're not going to do it. Okay. Well, let me, let me correct myself. The US venture capitalists wouldn't do it. The Chinese venture capitalists, backed by the Chinese government, were happy to do it. They were happy to give Boston Power that money, but just a slight condition, which is Boston Power had to build a plant in China, not in Massachusetts, which it did. So basically, what we have is essentially these fundamental breakthrough sectors that are not new apps, but true fundamental technologies are not being financed by the venture capitalists in our society. So we essentially have the situation where private R&D is not leading to the breakthroughs. It's not leading to the rapid productivity growth that we saw um, in the decades after World War II, okay? Now, that doesn't mean the government can do any better, okay? The fact, you know, when I teach my core, my base economics to my students, I say, look, the first thing you have to ask is, can the market fix it? If the market can fix it, you have to ask, can the government make it better? Just because the market doesn't work doesn't mean the government will make it better. But in this case, we have point after point of evidence that the government can actually make it better. Now, I've given you the historical record, but let's forget history, okay? Let's talk about the current record and the examples of the government Government investments in R&D that lead to fundamental breakthroughs in economic growth today. And let's focus on a terrific example, which is what happened when in the mid-1980s, a Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize winning biologist Walter Gilbert, who'd won the Nobel for discovering how to sequence DNA, and who'd started a company called Biogen, which you may have heard of, a pretty successful startup, decided that the future lie in mapping the entire human genome. A radical idea at the time that given current technologies would have taken decades. But his view was, look, if we start in this activity, new technology will get invented that'll make this more feasible over time. And I just need $10 million to get started. $10 million, no one will give it to him. No private company, no private VC, because they said, look, this is gonna take decades, and once you discover it, it's public knowledge anyway, so what's in it for us? So he couldn't do it. Fortunately, some forward-thinking politicians decided to fund this at the public level, creating what's called the Human Genome Project, a $3 billion project over 13 years financed by the US government. Today, the genomics industry in America employs 270,000 people with an average wage of $70,000 a year, and in one year alone, pays $6 billion in taxes. Okay, off a three-year, 13-year, three thir three, 13 three billion investment, not bad. But that's not, you know, dozens of examples. Let's take another example about a small company in Cambridge, founded by some MIT grads, that was doing defense contract work, getting R&D funding and contracting from the government to create innovative ways to find landmines. And they realized, wait a second, these little things we're around finding landmines could also work as vacuums. Okay, that company was iRobot, and that's the Roomba. A thousand Americans now have jobs making Roombas because of this government R&D investment. And an example after example, these government interventions do make a difference, and they create good jobs. Okay, so that is the story, that the private sector R&D will not create these new sectors well enough. The public sector can. 
But both the public and the private sector suffer from a common problem, which is they are way too focused on a small set of elite technology hubs, of which this is one. Okay? Two thirds of all venture capital in America is in five cities. Half of it's in Silicon Valley. Okay? The vast majority of public R&D funding goes to states on the coast. As a result, we are splitting apart as a country. We are basically what's called the great diversion. The great divergence, I'm sorry. We used to converge, now we're diverging. So for example, in 1980, five of the top, of the top 10 highest earning cities in America, three were on the coast, five were in Michigan. Today of the top 10 highest earning cities in America, nine are on the coast, none in Michigan are in the top 20, okay? So basically, we've essentially split to now the coastal cities are the higher earners, and what's happening is every year they're getting higher and higher wealth for the rest of the country. Okay? They're basically, that we're essentially concentrating innovation and the higher earning jobs in this small set of cities. Okay? Now, on its face, that's not necessarily a problem. It's an example of what economists call agglomeration. Now, here's, if, if you learn one thing tonight, okay, remember, here's the secret to why economists make a lot of money because we make up fancy words for really obvious concepts, okay? <laughs> Agglomeration simply means talented people want to live with talented people, okay? So once a place becomes a tech hub, everyone wants to go there. So Simon and I have taken to asking our classes, everywhere we talk to students, all around the country, we ask them, how many of you would like a job somewhere other than Boston, New York, DC, Seattle, San Francisco, LA? <laughs> In no classes would that number ever gotten higher than 10%, okay? Everyone wants to go to those cities. Those are the tech hubs. That's where they want to go. And that's not necessarily a problem. Agglomeration is a good thing. It means that basically by my being around other skilled people, we can both work better together and create new things. The problem is it only works if I can afford to live there. And I can't because what these cities have done is they've created constraints on growth, okay? Look, you know, Weston houses are very nice, and I'm sure it's nice. You have to have a two-acre yard, but a two-acre minimum zoning does not exactly allow for a lot of building for people to be able to get into Boston, okay? <laughs> and you just you take a look out in the Boston sky, it's a lot of beautiful brownstones, but you can't fit a lot of people in Boston. It's not just Boston. Over and over again, towns place constraints. You know, look at Silicon Valley, the most va Palo Alto, the most valuable real estate in the world. It's all low-slung, single-family homes, okay? That there's constraints on development. We can't put people in these places because we're not building enough in these places. Okay, in 1980, if you look at the top 10 highest earning cities, the average price of a house in those cities was 25% higher than the average for all cities in America. Today, the average house price in the top 10 cities is 300% higher than the rest of America. I mean, you know, if you haven't been out, out of our bubble, you don't realize how cheap real estate is in the rest of the country, okay? We basically, essentially, we've created a set of elite cities where only very talented rich people can afford to live. And essentially, we're turning off the rest of the country. And that's both the effect of the private sector and the public sector, and we're spending our dollars. Now, one answer we've heard is, well, that's just life. Maybe that's just the town, where the talent is and we're done. But that's simply wrong. There's talent spread throughout our country that's not being used. And so to look at this, we went to the data. We said, look, how many places in America are big, they have at least 100,000 people, are educated, at least 25% college graduates, and have an average house price less than $260,000? Wouldn't that be nice? Okay? We, those three criteria, we found 102 cities in 36 states with 80 million people. They meet those criteria. Places like Rochester, New York. Rochester, New York has an excellent university. It has People from Rochester love it. Every time I get to talk to Rochester, they're like, yay, Rochester. They have, I even learned a word to explain it. There's a word called topophilia, love of place. People from Rochester have enormous topophilia. Okay? <laughs> they want to go back, but the jobs aren't there. But I'll tell you, it's a nice place to live. The average house costs $170,000. Okay? And Rochester, one of the growth areas in technology in America is optics and photonics. In 25 years, we're not going to store data on wires anymore. We're going to store data on lasers. Where better to work on optics and photonics than Rochester, New York? the former home of, of, of Xerox and Bosch and Lom and, and other company in Kodak, okay? Basically, the, but what's the problem? The problem is that no one wants to go to Rochester. They might say, oh, it's because of the weather. But, you know, Minneapolis is doing pretty well. That weather's worse. Uh, so basically, no offense to my Minneapolis wife. 
Um, uh, so um, who always notices when you see the car ads where they're testing cars in the snow, it's always in northern Minnesota where they test these cars in the snow. Um, so basically, uh, it's that basically they can't grow their companies there because there's not the concentration of talent and there's not the financing. So let me turn to my favorite story in the book and my, and my sort of jerky question I'm going to ask. It's jerky because uh, so far I've asked this to about 1,500 people and 13 have gotten it right. So don't feel bad if you get it wrong. Please do not yell out your answer. Okay, please, just keep it to yourself. What city in America is the home, the hub of the computer simulation industry for the US if not the world? And either the first or second largest university in America by enrollment. It goes back and forth between first and second. So let's call it first for now. The hub of the computer simulation industry and home of the largest university in America. Okay. Think about it for a minute. Now, did anyone who hasn't read our book guess Orlando, Florida? Don't feel bad. <laughs> you, just, you just helped my stacks. Okay. Great story. 1956, the editor of the Orlando Sentinel endorses a little known politician for president named Lyndon Johnson. Does so again in 1960, holds a big parade for him in 64. 64, Johnson calls him and says, you've been really good to me, what do you want? He says, I want a Navy base. Now, does Lyndon Johnson let the fact Orlando is landlocked stop him? <laughs> no, he's Lyndon Johnson. He gives Orlando a Navy base. It's even a cement ship out front, okay? And what do you do in a landlocked Navy base? You train people. And as part of that training, there was a small unit on Long Island at that time called a battle simulation unit that they moved down to the Orlando base. Fast forward to 1978, the University of Central Florida, a mid-sized, fairly mediocre university, um, uh, has an innovative president who realizes land is super cheap, <coughs> interest rates are very high. So he realized he can buy land below his university for $2,000 an acre. So he goes to the Navy and says, look, you've got this unit on your base. It's now doing sort of this early kind of computer simulation of battle. What if you take that unit off the base, move it 12 miles east to below my university and build a research park around it? And then we'll sort of create a whole in, you know, ecosphere around that. And, and the Defense Department agreed to do it. Okay? Today, the Central Florida Research Park has 10,000 employees working there. It's the third largest research park in America. East Orlando, 45 minutes from Disney, has added 100,000 jobs in 30 years. And the University of Central Florida is now the largest university in America and the 10th ranked electrical engineering department mm. in the country. Okay? That is the kind of success story that you can, how you can create a tech hub. But, but when I went to the, to the director of the Central Florida Research Park, I said, this is great. He said, well, not necessarily. He said, what happens is we have all this incredible innovation. Companies work, go back and forth between the university. You know, it's up the road. They go to the university, they come back, they invent their product. They're back and forth. They create these great products. Their company gets about 20 people, and then they leave. They go to New York and Boston and D.C. and San Francisco and Seattle and L.A. Because we don't have any venture capital. We're 45th in the country in venture capital. We can't get any money to grow. And because our education system is terrible. Florida's 45th in the country in math, in math education. So basically, the problem is, if we want to take places, take that next step, Orlando, Rochester, the 102 places we identify in our book, which are all over the country, 36 different states, we need the government to give it a jump start. And so now we come to the sort of aspirational part of the book, aspirational, delusional, depending on how you think about it, okay, which is our proposal. Our proposal is, that the US government invests an enormous amount of money in public R&D. We throw out the number of $100 billion a year, 0.5% of GDP, which would take us back up to, to like number one or two in the world. Okay, we wouldn't dominate like we used to, but at least we'd be up towards the, leader, at the top of the leadership board. Okay, for public R&D. We invest that money, but importantly, we invest that money in a way that tries to spread the wealth around the country. And the way we want to do that is by following the lead of Amazon. Let's go back to what we started the story with. Amazon, remember, had a competition. How did places compete to win Amazon's love? By offering the biggest damn tax break they could. And that's how places compete in America. Every year, states and localities spend $50 billion a year offering tax breaks to corporations to move there. Corporations that would have probably moved there anyway. The best defense is that 90% of the corporations that get tax breaks would have moved there anyway, okay? And basically, it's a race to the bottom. It's just a race to how many of the taxpayer dollars can we give to corporations. We're saying, why not learn from that and have a race to the top? Let's have a competition where coalitions of local politicians, universities, businesses, and, and federal representatives get together and propose that their city be a new technology hub. And let's have a competition for something on the order of 20 or 30 cities 
A, more than one, less than 50, because once it's 50, every state gets one, okay? So distinctly less than 50 around the country where basically we can create, we can invest large amounts of money in creating technology hubs of tomorrow. Now, of course, the big issue there is politically, that sounds like a real boondoggle, right? I mean, everybody's gonna pick their favorite location. Now, this is a challenge, we recognize that, but the one place we're optimistic is, is we, there is a historical example that's quite relevant here, which is think about one of the hardest decisions politicians ever have had to make, which is closing military bases. Closing military bases is super hard. Those are hundreds, not thousands of jobs directly in that in congressman's district. It's incredibly hard. So Congress, in its wisdom, set up the Base Realignment and Closing Commission. Remember House of Cards season one, that's what he's testifying in front of, was the Base Realignment and Closing Commission, which basically was tasked with creating an objective list of bases that should be closed to give it to the Department of Defense, to propose before Congress, and Congress only voted on an up or down basis. They couldn't cherry pick and say, I want this base and not that base. And it worked. We've closed hundreds of military bases. Well, closing military bases is way harder than opening new technology hubs. So if that can work once, we think that kind of mechanism work again. We're not saying it's easy. We're clear-eyed about this. Simon and I have both been involved in politics for many years. We understand the challenges, but at least we think it's, it, it's a direction we can head. So that's the second piece. Let's set up a competition. Places will compete to be new technology hubs in particular with proposals to improve their education system with federal funding, to improve their infrastructure, and to create the technology hubs of the future. The hope is that 20 years from now, when the next Amazon's looking for its HQ2, it's really choosing between 20 or 50 places and not just a handful of places Amazon was actually looking at, okay? But the third part of our proposal too, which is recognizing that the goal of this has to be to enrich all of America, not just a few successful entrepreneurs. Now in principle, that's what our tax code does. In practice, it's not working out so well, as we've seen by the fact that, you know, for example, FedEx owes zero taxes this year, okay? We basically, we need another way to make sure that the fruits of this investment is given back to the American <laughs> taxpayer. And that's what we propose that we call an innovation dividend. The innovation dividend is modeled after an idea from Alaska. Alaska is what's called the Alaska Permanent Fund, where every year revenues from oil created in Alaska go into a fund that gets paid out to every Alaskan as a flat check, between $1,000 and $2,000 every year, depending on the price of oil. And that's not a lot of money, but it actually lifts 20,000 Alaskans out of poverty every single year. Okay? We want to do the same thing. But the way we're going to finance it is not out of oil revenues, but out of technology revenues. In particular, when you set these new technology hubs, you're going to create very, very valuable real estate, like Kendall Square. Let's talk about Kendall Square for a minute. So Simon and I were students at MIT in the mid-1980s. Kendall Square was a dump. As Simon says, you used to have to leave and go to Central Square to get mugged. Okay? <laughs> there was nothing in Kendall Square. At one point, Boston used it as a, literally as a snow dump for the excess snow in Boston. Today, the real estate in Kendall Square is the most valuable in the country, tied with Midtown Manhattan. Okay? That is because of companies that were started on the back of NIH funding. Okay? NIH funding is responsible for the biotech revolution in our country, including the Human Genome Project. But did the government get the returns from that? No, some guys who opened the, happened on the land in Kendall Square got some returns, including MIT, to be fair, but some others as well got the benefit from that. So our proposal is, as part of the technology hub bidding, you would have government ownership of the land, or at least a government stake in the value of the land around these new tech hubs. So that when that land goes through the roof as the tech hub succeeds, some of that money kicks back to the government to fund a flat dividend to all Americans. We call the innovation dividend. So that's our three part proposal. More R&D, spread it around the country, return, re return the benefits to individuals. Let me just close with what the last chapter of the book talks about, which is why, wh what's the rush? Where's the fire? And basically, we think, you know, this isn't, we don't have Sputnik, we don't have Hitler, we don't have this thing serious in the face that you've got to do this. But we think we have two equivalents. One is the divisions in our country, which I think we see daily are ripping our country apart. And are of many dimensions, but geographic's an, a big one. The second piece uh, we have is international competition, because other countries have learned the lesson of our history. Other countries are investing public dollars in R&D, in particular China who's made a priority to invest money in public R&D. And in particular, create new, new learning from us, they've created new giant research hubs, research parks, where they co-locate R&D and manufacturing. So if things get invented, it goes right to the jobs to make those goods, okay? And in the last chapter of the book, we talk about example after example of new technologies invented on, based on government financing, perfected in the US, 
that are now creating jobs in China because we did not stick with them. So let me talk about one, one of my favorite examples, synthetic biology. An incredible growth area, essentially recreating biological processes in the lab. So for example, we basically recreated the Chinese wormwood plant that cures malaria. We created it and, cr and it treated 100,000 people with malaria. We're creating new technologies all the time in the lab. This was invented, started at MIT, with an NSF grant. The NSF put a huge, National Science Foundation put a huge amount of money into growing this field. They even set up a competition called the iGEM competition, which was sort of unfair because the US won it every year because we only get people that did this. So we had these competitions. We always won. We created tech and tech biology. What happens after 10 years, the NSF funding ran out. So the NSF went to the Sloan Foundation, an objective, well-respected foundation, said, do a study for us of this investment. Sloan did a study and came back and said, we studied it, and now this is an incredibly productive investment. You should double down on this. Well, instead, the US government decided not to fund it at all. The NSF killed the program. Uh, as a result, the US now does not do nearly as much research as synthetic biology, but it's a huge priority, in particular for Asian nations, in their research funds. As seen by the fact that in the latest competition, the one member set up by the NSF, China won the majority of the, of the prizes, and the US won a small minority. So in, in area after area, we are losing our lead. And so now's the time we need to regain that lead. And the way we're going to regain it, we argue, is by remembering the lessons of history and of economics, which is that science means jobs. Okay? We need to rec recognize that investment in science is investing not just in cool stuff, but investing in the growth of the American economy. And we need to make that investment because only by once again creating a rising tide are we going to lift all the boats in this country. So let me stop there and uh, take your questions. specialized or are you looking for more cross fertilization so you want to get uh, core scientific areas? So one thing I love talking about this book, especially while talking about healthcare, is that um, I can be okay with not having the answers to a lot of questions. Uh, because in some sense, we view this book as starting the conversation, not ending it. And you've asked the kind of question that we don't really necessarily know the answer to. But I will give you what my vision. My vision would be places would start not super specialized, but broadly specialized. You think of Rochester, New York, and optonics. Think of Ames, Iowa, and new, um, new inventions in agricultural processes. Think of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who's doing incredibly innovative things on uh, treating water to deal with floods and to deal with desalination. But I think it's only going to work if those places eventually diversify. Indeed, look at where the growth in Kendall Square is happening right now. It's not in biotech, actually. It's in AI and robotics, which used to be out in Silicon Valley. But now it's coming to Kendall because we got so big in biotech that smart people there, they want to come do other things there. So I think the vision is what's happened in, in Kendall, which you start fairly specialized like we did in biotech, but then eventually grow to be a more general purpose tech hub. So my colleague Matt also has a microphone. He'll handle questions on that side of the room. We'll go back and forth. So just raise your hand again if you have a question. Thank you. So I'm curious, uh, have you thought about there's a mechanism called work opportunity tax credits. Are you familiar? I mean, it yep. was an attempt. It was. Uh, what do you think of this mechanism of redistributing or trying to address? Maybe to explain it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, there's a number of tax mechanisms the federal government uses to try to encourage economic growth. So one is the work opportunity tax credits. That's essentially a tax credit that employers get for hiring low wage employees. Um, and I think that's been evaluated as fairly successful. I think if you look at a lot of these tax credits, they're always sort of valued as like marginally successful. Like it's a little bit better than the money we spent on it, but not a whole lot. It's not game changing. It's not really creating a huge boost, huge boost. I think, you know, this, there is another more recent tax credit which is in the news lately, which is Opportunity Zones, which was part of the Trump tax plan, which in principle provides a real mechanism to do this, essentially giving a capital gains tax break to companies that invest in certain areas. The problem is it was badly designed. Uh, in particular, a lot of investments in real estate to qualify in a lot of areas which are wealthy areas that don't really need the jobs to qualify as well. So we are clear-eyed. The politics here is really daunting. Okay? But there are examples, but I think the key thing is that we learn from those examples and try to move forward with best practices. You've uh, touched on this some, but I, I'd like uh, some more definition. Um, MIT has, what, 50% foreign students, and so if you take uh, 
say, all the grants you have, and as you reach new breakthroughs, that information is being transmitted to uh, other countries. How do we keep our edge and truly uh, benefit from the investment? You know, that's a great question. This is something we tackle a lot in the last chapter of the book. We talk about the international context. Right now, we've got a huge problem with technology theft. Uh, and, and, and actually, uh, here I'm just going to paraphrase what the president of MIT was said. He was, I was at a meeting the other night, but he was asked this very question. And he said that we all grow when we, part, when we learn together. And that really, these students who come, the ones that, the students at MIT are not the problem. Students at MIT are working with American professors, working with American students. They're creating joint ventures that work. The problem is more that China has a practice where they insist you keep a plant over there, and then when you plant over there, they steal what you're doing. Okay, that is a problem. Now, tariffs is not the right way to deal with it, but it is a problem. What is the right way to deal with it? The right way to deal with it is to always be ahead of the curve. The right way to deal with people reverse engineering our technology is say, fine, have that. We're already on the next technology. That's how. That's how you keep growing by being on the cutting edge. So that by the time they reverse engineered what you've done, you're on to the next thing. You're creating jobs in the next thing. So I think we have to remember that time and time again we've seen the country that invents it gets a lot of jobs from it. Not only invents it, think about standards. Think about cell phones. 2G was invented in Finland and Europe. Huge amounts of jobs. Was perfected, huge amounts of jobs. 3G then Japan, huge amounts of jobs in that sector. 4G the US, huge amounts of jobs in that sector. 5G, we're still fighting over it. But basically, where this, techno now, where this technology is invented, standards get set. And importantly, let's not forget, let's go back to why public R&D failed in the first place. You also set ethical and environmental standards. Okay? We are talking about some of these technologies. Synthetic biology, you know, we can, within about 10 years, kill all mosquitoes on Earth if we want. Do we want to? I kind of think so, but I'm not an expert. We'd like to have the experts in this area thinking about it and working on it and not just let some country invent it and decide if they want to do it. We want to be at the table when those decisions are made. And the only way to do it is by leading in technology. It's working. It's working. Okay, you've talked about the aggregate amount of R&D, but what you haven't talked about the composition of the R&D. And from my experience, and I think the experience of a number of people who are here who've been in the R&D community, that's very important. Not just the overall fields, but the, the mix of basic, intermediate, engineering and everything else. Because you, you can pour a lot of money down a rat hole uh, by, for, for example, over-investing in engineering at a point when the, the, the base won't support it, or vice versa. Yeah, I, it, it's a great question. And once again, it's the kind of question where I get to be wishy-washy. I don't really have the answer. I will say that we've seen a huge shift away from basic science towards development in our country, in the, pri in the private sector. And I think there have been too big a shift. But it, you can't just be basic science. You need all stages. You need to essentially do the basic science to vent the stuff, but then you need to take it from the bench to the, ship, to, the, to the marketplace, and that involves development. We need both. And I think importantly, we need the, the basic research will not happen without the government. We need much more of that. So once again, take the NIH, National Institute of Health. The estimates are that every dollar we invest in NIH today yields $3 in stock market value. Every dollar in NIH yields $8 in private sector R&D. It's an incredibly productive investment. We should do more of that. But we also need to invest in closing what's called that valley of death that inventors get to when they have the idea, but they can't get the money to take it to market. Now, in that case, the private sector is already there some, so we need to work with them, not displace them. I mean, after all, you know, I may be an, 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 an unredeemable liberal, but my co-author is after, after all, at a business school. He's got to take this stuff seriously. Okay, and basically, we, we have to recognize the private sector is doing some of this financing. We need to partner them. We have a successful VC sector. We need to partner with them, not displace them, get them to take more of these risks that can allow the countries to be developed, the companies to be developed. So, um, you mentioned Hitler and you mentioned Sputnik. Uh, is climate change in the same class? Well, um, look, I mean, that's, that's, that's a long debate. Uh, I, you know, I, there's sort of a moral debate about how climate change stacks up relative to Hitler and Sputnik. I mean, clearly climate change is worse than Sputnik, 
relative, well, that, that's the debate we'd have to have. But clearly, it doesn't have the feature of urgency that Hitler and Sputnik had. And that and it, 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 is, it is urgent in the sense that eventually we will all die from it. Earth will be wiped out from it, but it's not like tomorrow. It's not next year. It's not really, honestly, in the next 20 years. It's over the next century. And basically, that is a problem politically. Um, but in particular, it's a problem for investing in technologies because essentially, when people point to the failure of our R&D machinery and our venture capital sector, the number one sector they point to is clean energy. That basically, we essentially have a situation where we're under-investing clean energy technologies. But clean energy also is the point we run into perhaps the biggest single problem with this book. The biggest single problem is the problem of Solyndra. Let me explain what happened. Okay, many of you probably know, under the Obama administration, we put, we put uh, something like $40 billion into clean energy technology. Okay, into, into basically funding companies to go with the clean energy technology, clean energy technology. One of those companies was Solyndra. Now Solyndra, through both a combination of bad luck and corporate malfeasance, went bankrupt. Okay, taking down with about $1.3 billion of government investment and leading to years of congressional hearings. Okay. The rest of the $40 billion, that is 98% of it, did great. The rest of the, 40, of the $40 billion led to enormous breakthroughs, including all the solar manufacturing in America. Cover that. Tesla exists because of loans it got from that program, et cetera. If you told a private inventor, a private investor, I just invested $40 billion and 98 plus percent of it returns investment, he'd be like, you're underinvesting massively. You should invest 100 times as much in a deal that good. But if you tell politicians, they focus on the Solyndra. That to me is the biggest challenge which is how do you get politicians to think like portfolio investors? How do you get them to realize that this is risky, so you've got to do a lot of it, and that means some's going to fail. And you've got to put up with the failure to allow, to allow the growth. I think that's a real challenge. Yeah. How would, you, uh, how would the government, uh, how would the government determine which areas to invest in? Yeah, I mean, basically, as I said, I, we, once again, there's lots of approaches to this. We, we propose a competition that there be a nonpartisan organization set up, the Innovation Commission, we call it, that have representation from both business and the government on it, to which areas would put proposals, much like areas proposed to Amazon. Those proposals would lay out how they're gonna improve their education system, how they are gonna make sure that universities and business and the government partner together to create an innovation ecosystem that can promote, that can promote growth of companies, talk about how they're gonna have sensible zoning regulations so they don't become San Francisco and Seattle and Boston, but actually grow in a way that's sustainable and allow for affordable housing. They're gonna put those proposals forward and that commission will choose. Now, I then wave my hands and say that commission will choose, but essentially, as I said, we have experience with this sort of thing before. That's, that, that would be one way to go forward. Oh, the technology. Well, that's, and that comes to the first question, sort of what's the right pair of technology in places? Once again, I'm gonna hand wave on that. I don't know the right answer to that. I do believe that on this commission would be scientists who would understand, look, I am not a technology futurist. I'm just technology optimist, okay? I can't tell you what technology will be great in 10 years, but I know there's a lot coming that are gonna be great. And we need to essentially take, put scientists on this commission that know where the most promising things are, what are the technologies that other countries are investing in, that are stretch goals but seeable goals, not like, not necessarily colonizing Mars, but improving synthetic biology, okay? and where we want to take a few shots and hope that some of them work out. Hi, that was a nice talk, first of all, and uh, interesting book, I, I did read it. And uh, so I have a couple of questions on that. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, one question, but if I could, I just, uh, in, your, in your book, and in your talk tonight, the heart of your proposal was to increase uh, R&D spending, and you proposed about half percent. Of, of GDP, and, uh, and that's going to lead to growth. You refer in your book to a particular paper called The Intellectual Spoils of War and Defense R&D Spillover Effects. And I just want to read sort of one, two, two sentences from, from that paper and then get your reaction to it. Um, it says that uh, we caution that this does not necessarily imply that it is desirable to raise defense R&D or government-funded R&D are finding that government-funded R&D results in an increase in productivity 
is by no means evidence that public monies were used efficiently. Government-funded R&D clearly has an opportunity cost in the form of taxpayer money used, plus any welfare loss that inevitably comes from taxation. So this seems to be something that was hardly addressed at all in your book, with the opportunity cost. And how, so how can you be sure that the benefits of this spending outweigh the loss and the harm done to taxpayers of giving up that money? That's a great question. That mild mannered man, by the way, is, is a demon on the tennis court. Let me just tell you that he, he, he may look calm, mild mannered now, but he cannot be stopped on the tennis court. Um, uh, that's a great question, and basically, um, we can't 100% guarantee it. All we can do is go by the evidence, and the evidence by actually the same co-authors who wrote that paper is that every dollar invested in public R&D yields a 50% rate of return. Now, you have to ask yourself, what's the opportunity cost of that money? Okay. I challenge you to find another government investment that is 50%, another investment, private or public, to that kind of rate of return on average. Now that's on average. Some will fail, some will succeed spectacularly. Remember with private VC, 90% of their money comes from 7% of their investments. Okay, some will fail. And so I think there's two issues. One is what's the opportunity cost? The opportunity cost, I think that the government would, this is a higher return activity than almost anything else the government can do in terms of causing economic growth. Now, the second issue in implied question is, will the politicians do it right? And that I can't guarantee at all. I mean, that, I, I, we are completely, so we're clear out about this. We're very clear in the book this only works with a, a, a non-political way to distribute this money, and we understand that's a challenge. But what is clear from the evidence is that basically it's an incredibly productive use of federal dollars. And indeed, if you think about, we need to recognize that the government all the time makes investments. Education is an investment in our children energy investment in our, in our environment. Even redistribution to poor people's investment in their futures. Okay? The government's making investments all the time. This is one of the highest return investments the government can make. And that's, so basically, if the government's gonna, so another way to say is if the government's gonna spend money, this is a place it should be spending. So financing public good that's under produced by uh, private sectors makes sense, and there are dire motivations, as you mentioned. But some of the problems uh, that you cited, for one, uh, the growth in uh, social programs, healthcare and Medicaid, uh, and Medicare has only grown larger, and uh, an increasing chunk of federal dollars goes to paying the interest rate for debt. So I suppose, uh, where do you create this 2% funding from the GDP? That's or great. That's a great question. So, and it's related to South's questions. It's, it's sort of, What's the opportunity cost? My view is we pay for it by increasing the government deficit. Because basically, you think, if, think about the government spending money on two things, transfers and investments. Transfers are, for example, Social Security payments. Okay, we are transferring money to people. That's not investment in anything. It's not that it's not valuable, it's a transfer. We don't expect it to yield a return. On investment, like we build roads, or spend money on education, or spend on R&D, is something we expect to yield a return. At the rates of return we expect to get from this, this is a solid investment for the government. Now, I understand we have a large deficit right now, and the notion of adding to that deficit uh, is difficult. I think two things to that. First of all, there is literally no economic model out there that would not say this would do more for growth than the equivalent size Trump tax cuts. Okay, literally no, said no, no non nonpartisan, non sort of no economic model not affiliated with the, with the political party would run the numbers on this program and the Trump tax cuts, let's say this program would increase economic growth more. So we spend that kind of money all the time, like in the last few years. The other is, if you're really worried about increasing the deficit, part of what you use is in this money we raise, this innovation dividend, could go back to pay the government back for its investment. So if, you really, if we really feel that this is not something we want to increase the deficit for, then let's recapture that investment. Let's recognize that there's enormous number of pharmaceutical companies and pharmaceutical stockholders making huge amounts of money off federal government investments. We need to recapture some of that, and that can help pay for this. Uh, so uh, I'm curious about the basic question of you know, growth that under, underlies all of this. Like, what exactly is growth? How do we measure it? And is it a universal good? Are there some disadvantages to growth? Yeah, that, yeah, like pollution, overpopulation, right. you know, things like that. Right. I'm just curious. The <laughs> what? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> For example, but so yeah, I'm just curious. 
you know, if you could comment a little bit about some of those yeah, issues. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, so the question is sort of, you know, growth, good or bad, discuss. Uh, and, and I think that that is a very deep and important question because, first of all, how we measure growth is really inappropriate. Indeed, a misleading fact, the stats I gave you, is a lot, if you measure growth as how much wealthier we get minus the damage we do, say, the environment, we grew a lot slower in the fewer decades than we thought we did because we were almost damaged the environment. Likewise, we're in some sense growing faster in the future than we think we are because some of what we'll be doing is repairing the environment, even though it's so up on economic growth statistics. So proper measures of growth would say that the returns this might be even higher because basically the innovations that we're doing are not things that have financial return so that, so that the private sector would not be doing them. So that's, that's sort of one answer. But the other answer I think really most importantly is just the geographic answer. You know, someone said in the back, you know, downside of growth, think about driving to Kendall Square. Okay, basically we need to spread these jobs across the country in places essentially where kids don't have opportunities, where there are people who are smart and eager to work, and we're basically, I'm not calling for a welfare program, let's be clear. We're not saying put new, gleaming new labs in Appalachia. But remember, the opioid country we're all worried about is commuting distance to Cincinnati. And that is a place that could be a technology hub. So a lot of it, mobility is vastly down in our country. People aren't moving anymore in America. Why? Because now if you want to move, you have to move all the way to the coast. And people don't want to do that. But if they have to move, that can move an hour or two away and have a good job, they're willing to do that. So we need the way to deal with the problems, some of the problems growth are causing congestion problems by spreading that around our country. And that we think it's going to take a jump start because otherwise the force of agglomeration are going to lead the country to continue down the road Amazon continued on, which is the same damn six places getting all the new innovation. About life expectancy, if you could take that segment of the population that's made the most comments, most contribution to wealth in the national group and extending their life twice a year. What would that do? In other words, life expectancy is someone control. Yeah, it, it's a great question. And basically, I think you know, it comes to, in some sense, the measure of growth. Uh, by some accounts, if you look at the improvements in health that we made in the decades after World War II, we actually grew something like twice as fast as measured growth. If you look at how much, if, if you value the improved health we've made in the U.S. And that's valuable. And I think we are at the cusp of, I, I don't think there's any lot of models today we live twice as long. We're at the cusp of enormous changes, not seeing the length of life, but in the ability to give everyone a fair opportunity at life, with particularly with cures for rare genetic diseases which are on the cusp, we are on the cusp over the next 10 years, we're projected out something like 25, 20 to 30 new diseases, new cures for things like muscular dystrophy, maybe hemophilia, okay? Uh, diseases which may not extend everyone's life, which take people who have lost the genetic lottery and allow them to actually lead a good full life. And that's amazing and unbelievably expensive. So now I have to put on my healthcare hat, okay? It's the, what my, my day job is worrying about healthcare and we have to worry about paying for that, and that is a challenge. And that is, you know, the questions, these questions about how we pay for this. We're facing enormous fiscal strains on the U.S. government. I think, honestly, taxes need to be higher in the U.S. I think we have the 14th highest tax burden in the OECD. I think we could clearly raise more of our economy in tax. I think we're going to have to, because there are four, there's going to be improvements in life which can be worth the price we're going to pay. We're going to have to figure out how we're going to raise the money to pay them. I think we have time for two more questions, if you are feeling up for it, Dr. Gruber. Oh, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> Good question on the new technology zones. Uh, with this agglomeration phenomenon, where you just have such a large critical mass that you'll simply create a lot of Orlando's where small companies will start out in Indianapolis and then move to Kendall Square when they get 36 employees and bring their cars with them, hopefully. You know, that is what we have to try to stop. I think, you know, look, a lot of people don't want to necessarily move to Kendall Square. I mean, a lot of people want to live in these other places. As I said people from Rochester love it and want to go back. So my hope is that you can create this. Look, it's not like God has dictated these places are the places that's the technology hubs. Let's think about what happened. I mean, who remembers where Bill, where Bill Gates started Microsoft? Okay, Albuquerque, New Mexico. He dropped out of Harvard, drove to Albuquerque, which was a natural place. They had a national lab, beautiful weather. They had a crime rate that was, they had a murder rate 50% lower than Seattle's. 
Okay, natural place to start it, but Bill Gates felt the call of home and he went back to Seattle. Not a natural choice at all. At that point, Seattle had a billboard at the airport saying, with the last one out of Seattle, please shut out the lights. And it was a disaster. Okay, but Bill Gates moved there and now it's one of the technology hubs of the world. Dakota, that's sort of course, in 1994, Jeff Bezos gets in his car in New York. Does he go to his home city of Albuquerque, New Mexico? No, he goes to Seattle. Okay, new places can be created. Okay, if things had worked out differently, Walter White could have been cooking meth in Seattle instead of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay, and these new places can be created. We just need, we need to work towards creating them. One last question? We can give Sal one more shot since he read the book so carefully. Okay. <laughs> I mean, come on, anyone who looks up the academic article will say some questions. Yeah, I, I looked up some more too. Okay. Uh, so you seem to be really confident that uh, you, know, you get positive returns on investment uh, from public spending on R&D. I think maybe the literature is not so clear on that. Maybe for defense R&D and that, that paper that you talked about was specific for defense R&D. But for non-defense R&D, I think that um, uh, there isn't much evidence that you get positive returns. And I'll, I'll read just, a, a, again, another sort of um, a brief quote from a study from the Congressional Budget Office. It's studies that examine the relationship between R&D spending and economic growth have yielded wide-ranging results. Economic research has yet to settle questions of complementarity, how federal R&D spending, spending affects R&D spending and timing, also how long it takes for changes in spending to have an effect on economic growth. So given this, how can you be so confident that your projections of increased growth by fraud spending are, are justified? Yeah, I think that basically, you know, look, um, one advantage I think for those of you who read a book by an academic at a research university is I have to write this book, then I have to go and sit at lunch with my colleagues and I have to look them in the eye and, and try to like, I, I can't bullshit in the book because they're going to catch me. And basically, really, what we have in the book is a proper reading of the literature. So for example, until about 15 years ago, it was true. We didn't really have solid evidence on whether, say, public R&D crowded out or complemented private R&D. Now the evidence is overwhelmingly clear, not just non-defense. My colleagues on research on NIH, for example, in particular, <coughs> studies that show the NIH dramatically, and they very interesting studies, studies just look like things which just barely, grants barely win versus barely lose. So they're basically comparable grants, one wins, one loses. That technology takes off and creates lots of jobs. The one that loses doesn't. So I think actually evidence is by and large pretty solid. Um, nothing is ever, these aren't laws like, like Yule's E equals MC squared. We, we don't know for sure. But the evidence in this area, believe me, someone's read literature in lots of areas, about as compelling as most areas where we put a lot more money. Uh, so. I think that's, that's all I can say. I'm also going to ask if everyone on their way out could kick Sal in the shin because we're playing tomorrow. <laughs> we're playing tomorrow, and he's just way faster than I am. So. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.